So this past March, I heard Corey Greaves speak at Next Church. Corey is of the Blackfeet tribe. He is a pastor and works with young people and, among other things, has formed the largest Presbyterian ministry among youth and young adults. He began his presentation by putting up a slide of the United States and showed where Native Americans lived prior to our coming. It obviously was sea to shining sea. And then he put up a slide where they live now, and it was small dots. And then he said, the church has seldom been a good thing for my people. And I thought, I think I know some people who would like that to be different. Jesus speaks to a woman. It wasn't supposed to happen. Not only was she a woman, she was a Samaritan. Her race was not purely Jewish. It wasn't supposed to happen. The culture of the day would not have brought them together, and if they did find one another, they wouldn't speak, certainly not in midday in public. But there they are, and Jesus crosses the boundaries to talk to her, and above all, and, and Uh, Surprisingly, they talk about the Messiah. The Messiah, you know, is the promised one of Judaism, the long-awaited king. The Messiah would come and make all things right. And if you worship the Messiah, the religion that you're practicing is Judaism. But the surprise of Jesus is that he did not limit his ministry to Jews. Not only that, those who followed him noticed, and we know they noticed, because the surprise of the early church is that people of every race were showing up, Jews and Gentiles and even a Samaritan woman. Without question, without question, the most significant social issue of the early church was race. Every book in the New Testament deals with it. The most significant issue of the early church was race. How can Jews and Gentiles, how can children of Abraham and this Samaritan woman find themselves in the same community when every structure of the culture said they were to be separated? From the very beginning, Followers of Jesus were required to pay attention to race. This is a surprising thing for white folks like me and you, many of you. Because Debbie Irving, in her book, Waking Up White, she says, as a white person, I actually never thought about the fact that I have a race. When people mention race, I thought about other folks with brown or black skin. I thought white was a raceless race, she said, just plain normal, the one against which all others are measured. I think the church, to become a good thing for all people, means like Jesus, We don't need to ignore race. We need to increase our attention to it, ours and others. And to admit that in America, not all are treated the same. Now, if you've got butterflies in your stomach, you're not alone. People around you are anxious. Just think about what it's like to be me right now, just getting ready to talk to you about this. If you're a little bit nervous about this, I get it. Someone emailed me this week and said, Tom, honestly, I'm just exhausted by all this talk about racism. Well, me too. And I know this, nothing makes us feel more defensive more quickly than for someone to suggest that we are racist. It's a tender topic. But I want us to sit with this discomfort for a little while. And I promise you this, 
I will not leave you sobbing over a little boy and his dog. I promise I will not do that. I do have some compassion. I'm just going to talk about racism, but it won't be as hard as last week. It was W.E.B. Du Bois who said, the problem of 20th century America is the color line. But so much has changed since Du Bois wrote that. John Meacham in his book, The Soul of America, said, after King, after Rosa Parks, after John Lewis, after the watershed legislative work on civil rights bills in the 60s, many Americans are less than eager to acknowledge that our national greatness was built on explicit and implicit apartheid. Well, even if we admit that that's the truth of our past, we're not who we were. I mean, when, when people mention racism, many of us think of vicious beatings on the Pettus Bridge in Selma or the horrors of the Middle Passage, or we think of slaveholders in the antebellum South, or we think of separate schools and separate drinking fountains. We think of the Ku Klux Klan and their bedsheets engaged in mob violence. Now, we know it hasn't gone away. In recent years, we've seen the ugliness of the alt-right as they marched in Charlottesville to de defend themselves against what they called white oppression. Dylan Roof did Bible study before he shot a room full of black people in the Emanuel Church. John Ernest shoots up a synagogue in Poway, California. According to the Washington Post, there are as many as 22 million people who believe it is, 22 million people in this country who believe it is acceptable to hold neo-Nazi or white supremacist views. We know that's there, but that's not us. That's not you. It's not me. We don't act like that. We find that kind of behavior unacceptable. We don't talk like that. The truth is, we've not only cast aside those attitudes, but many in this church have worked in ministries of care and justice among people of colors as long as village has been village. I mean, you see the pictures out in the Welcome Center. It was Dr. Bob who told you that the housing covenants that were attached to the deeds of the houses in which we lived were sinful. And when the sewing family moved into Fairway, Dr. Bob knocked on their door just like he knocked on all of yours. He wanted the church to be good for everyone. Dr. Eddie Glade, Jr., a professor of religion and African-American studies at Princeton, wrote... White people's express racial attitudes by most measure have become progressively better. Most Americans don't hold the racist views of Strom Thurmond in 48, or George Wallace in 68, or Pat Buchanan in 92. They believe in integrated schools and reject segregated public transportation. Yes, there may be 22 million Americans who are white supremacists, but we aren't those people. And if someone implies that we are racist, we get defensive quickly. We want to say, wait a minute, you don't know me. You don't know my heart. I am not a racist. So to that reaction, two things. The first is, we may not be as clear about our heart as we think. There may be some bias. And if you're not biased, you are the only person in the history of people to achieve that. So we'll talk a little bit about bias next week. I'll do that with Reverend Nishioka. But today, I want to talk about the fact that this conversation is not just about your heart. It's not just about your attitude. Racism in America is less an event or an attitude. It is a structure. It's not about you. It's about us. It's about all of us. 
It's not about whether the American is racist. America is racist. And while the consequences are not the same, every one of us is caught up in racist structures. So when we say, no, wait a minute, you don't know me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not racist. I'm not going to tell you that's wrong. I do want to tell you that's incomplete. It's not enough. I think we need to pay attention to race, ours and others, and we need to recognize the systems of the culture don't work the same for everyone. This is what I know about you. I know you believe every person is a child of God. You believe every person is created in the image of God. I know you believe that. And so we confess, theologically, we are all the same. Theologically, we are all the same. But the problem is, we don't all experience the culture the same. It's different. And if you are a Samaritan woman, those two words define how you experience the culture. Race matters. Read, uh, that's why I say that racism is not just an event or an encounter, it's a structure. Racism occurs not just when bias exists. Everybody can be biased. Anybody can be biased. It's not just a white person's problem. Anybody can be biased. The problem is when bias is partnered with cultural power. Read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. It's about the criminal justice system. We could talk about the banking system, real estate system, health care. We could talk about the church. Let me just use this as an example, the criminal justice system. Dr. Alexander says race plays a major role in the criminal justice system, but not because of what is commonly understood as old-fashioned bigotry. No, the problem is slipperier than that. It's more racial indifference, not racial hostility, racial indifference. She sounds a bit like Dr. King when he said the real problems are not the deeds of evil people, but the apathy of people of goodwill. So I was driving home. I was driving home one night, and I had the opportunity to meet one of the officers that works in the area. <laughs> he invited me to pull over to the side and have a little chat. Turns out having your tag renewal sticker in your glove box doesn't count. And so he explained this to me and then he went back to his car, I don't know, to play a game of solitaire or to call his family or to order lunch. I, I don't know. He was back there forever, it seemed like, the lights flashing. I'm on the side of the road trying to blend into the headrest. All of Village Church is driving by. I thought about even getting a piece of paper and write, even the Apostle Paul went to prison. You know, I, I thought, <laughs> but it just seemed, it seemed helpless at the time. And, and, then, and then he came up and he said, um, I'm going to give you a warning. I said, thanks. I don't know what the sentence is for not having your tag renewed sticker in the glove box instead of, but I said, thank And he said, yeah, I'm going to give you a warning. And, and I was grateful. I was grateful. And, you know, he's got that discretion. Michelle Alexander says that discretion in the criminal justice system often works against people of color. And it's not just her opinion. She's got data. A lot. The Kansas City Star reported last year that in 2017, of all of the tickets, all the citations for traffic violations, 60% went to people of color. They constitute 30% of the population. 
So do you think you and me just drive better? Or does discretion sometimes work against people of color? NPR reported several years ago that the young black man, when pulled over, has a 20 times higher percentage of being shot than a young white man, 20 to 1. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services released data in 2000, it's, it's old. It indicated that illegal drug use in white households was 6.4%. And their data revealed that among black households, 6.4%. The same level of illegal drug use. That stunned me because you know like I do the prisons indicate that it's much different than that. The United States holds today the highest incarceration rate among developed countries. And as late as the, or as early as the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, a study revealed that in the state of Georgia, cases involving a black defendant and a white victim, that 70% of those cases sought the death penalty but reverse the races, a white defendant and a black victim, and 70% drops to 19%. Laws are laws, but their implementation has discretion. And the data indicates the discretion can work against people of color. That's what I mean that racism is not just an encounter, it's a structure in our society, and we are all caught in that. We don't have consequences that are the same, but we are all caught in that. My friend Paul said, keep your hands visible at all times. Absolutely no fast movement. Tell the officer you are reaching for your license. Never raise your voice. Whatever you are feeling, stuff it. Paul was telling his boys how to interact when they were stopped. So look, I was invited by the Prairie Village Police to be a volunteer chaplain, and I volunteered immediately. I'm the worst one they have. They've got five or six. I'm the worst one they have. But, but I said yes because I appreciate what they do, and I know the stress and risk that they face every day. And in every congregation I've served, I've had law enforcement officers. I've had people in part of the criminal justice. In every congregation I've served, and to a person, I admire them. They are people of good character. But the truth is, my friend Paul felt it important to talk to his boys about how to act when they get stopped. I never had that conversation with my kids. Not because I don't think they're going to get stopped. I've seen them drive. <laughs> I just didn't worry about what would happen if they were. But Paul knows 60%. Paul knows 20 to 1. Paul knows. And he worries. He worries like any daddy would worry. Do you see this? This is not just about you and me. That's too small. America is racist. And we're all caught in the consequences of that. So just another example in another field. In 1850, the country started monitoring infant mortality rates. And for a black child born in 1850, the infant mortality rate was one and a half times that of a white child in 1850. Now, the numbers of children that die in infancy are dramatically reduced but the percentage has widened. A black child is now twice as likely to die in infancy as 
a white child. So for a long time, we thought this has got to be related to poverty or lack of education or other kind of social things. But the New England Journal of Medicine revealed that infants born to college-educated white families are half as likely to die as infants born to college-educated black families. So why? They think it's stress. The daily stress of battling a system that is stacked against you. As a study published in the American Journal of Public Health states, for black women, something about growing up in America seems to be bad for your baby's birth weight. It's stress. Now I know, some are going to say, this is, this is ridiculous. Everybody's got a chance here. Anyone can succeed in this country. They just have to want to succeed. They have to be disciplined. And they will suggest that the systems are perfect. It's only individuals who fail. Anyone who acts responsibly will be fine in this country. So, you know me. I am a big fan of responsibility. I preach to you often about responsibility. I think one of our Christian responsibilities is to pay attention to race, ours and others, and to recognize and believe folks when they tell us their experience is not the same. I, I know our reaction may be, no, 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 wait, 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 I'm not, I'm not racist. I get that. I understand that. I'm just not sure we're the ones who are supposed to be defining what racism is. I think we need to be listening in this conversation. Poor Greaves said, the church has not been good for my people. And I thought, I know some people who want that to be different. I know some people who want the church to be good for you and good for all. And I think we can get better. Jesus talked to a Samaritan woman. Those two words, Samaritan woman, defined how she engaged the culture, and they also declared she would never have a conversation with the Messiah. She wasn't pure enough, and she was of the wrong gender. But Jesus didn't buy into the systems. And he crossed the boundaries, and he changed her life because he saw her not simply as a Samaritan woman, but as a Samaritan woman who is a child of God. And the church noticed, it paid attention. Because in the early church, it was not simply Jews but disciples from every race, including a Samaritan woman. On Pentecost, they said there were Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia. There were Cretans and Arabs, parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. There were people of every race that came to this church. Something magical happened there. Look. There are 22 million people in America who celebrate white supremacy. And they, they push a narrative that white folks like you and I, we're under oppression now. Don't believe that. And that's not us. But as followers of Christ, we have responsibilities. Even if we're not guilty of the worst expressions, we have responsibilities. We need to pay attention to race, to ours and others. Have some conversations. Read some books. We need to do our own homework now. Read some books. Study some history. Don't assume that our experience is just plain, normal, universal. 
After generations of slavery and Jim Crow and mass incarceration, I honestly don't know when we're going to get past this. And the truth is, while the consequences are not equal at all, we are all caught in this system of race. And I don't know when we'll get past it. But we can pay attention in a different way. And the church can be good for all people. This is what I know about you. You are not satisfied that we're just better than we were. You want, you want life to be the way God wants life to be. So we'll try. And if we fail, we'll try again. And if we fail, we'll fail better. But we'll pay attention. And there's a Samaritan woman in glory who's going to be watching. Because she knows, like millions of others know, in a way that we probably never will, just how much it matters for the church to pay attention to race. Pray with me. Gracious God, we believe Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.